Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome. My name is Linda Woodhead. I'm Professor of Sociology of Religion at Lancaster University and uh, with Charles Clark, who is a former Education and Home Secretary uh, and a colleague uh, at Lancaster. He's a visiting professor in my department. Uh, we together organise these faith debates, the Westminster Faith Debates, and this one on uh, the future of RE is one of those. Um, the 1944 Education Act talked in terms of religious instruction and the concordiat between the churches and the government at that time in 1944 was about religious instruction taking place in schools. By the time we got to 1988, the 1988 Education Reform Act, the language was about religious education in schools, a rather different uh, concept, and that's, of course, how it's been used in the language ever since. So I'm going to just kick off and ask the panel what you think uh, RE really is for. Why do we do RE at all? Professor Adam Dinham, Director of Faiths and the Civil Society Unit of Goldsmiths University of London. So what's RE for? Well, um, my answer to this will, is that it has to be absolutely practical. It, it needs to equip young people as they leave school for an engagement with a, a plural, a religiously plural society that we haven't been very good at talking about for 60, 70 years or so. We've lost the ability to talk about religion and belief. Joyce Miller is the chair of the RE Council. Joyce. Um, I think it can be the most humanising of the areas of the curriculum because it makes young people engage with really difficult, deep questions. So I think that is what RE is for. It's about big questions and helping children become um, more human. Um, a second aspect that I think is very important is a phrase that um, we used when I worked in Bradford in diversity and cohesion. And one of the things we came up there was the idea of young people becoming skilled intercultural navigators. We paraphrased that from a report about young Asian um, people living in London and how they could move between their home culture and um, cultures around them. We wanted that for teachers and young people so that everyone had the skills of intercultural navigation and cultural in its broadest sense there. And I think RE has a big contribution to make to that. Andrew, Andrew Copson is the uh, Chief Executive of the British Humanist Association, uh, coming at it with a very particular angle. Andrew, what's your take on these questions? I can think of three reasons why um, what I would want young people to study, learn about, engage with religious and non-religious worldviews in the curriculum, whether or not they're going to do it in a subject called RE or in a, a number of different subjects or in a subject called something else, I don't know. Um, one of them is absolutely for sure uh, the reason that was given right at the beginning is that um, we want a certain level of cultural literacy in young people to enable them to navigate an increasingly complex society in our country and globally. Um, and you know, one of the things that learning about different people's points of view can do is to equip you to uh, live in that complicated, more complicated society that admits of a huge amount of diversity. I also think that it's important to engage with religious and non-religious worldviews because just from a humanities point of view, they're an incredibly important part of human heritage and human culture as well as uh, living human societies today. So given that they are such an important consequence of human beings uh, living together, thinking about big topics and having a cultural effect, uh, we need to learn about them from that point of view. And the third reason um, is very much uh, allied with the last points that were made on the other side of, of the stage, which is for reasons of personal development. Dr. Mark Chater is the director of Cullum St. Gabriel's College. Mark. But I, I have to say, I, I, I find it really alarming that we do not know the answer to this question about the purpose of RE. If you look at other um, uh, subject disciplines in the curriculum, they've got a fairly straightforward answer which they can convey in a couple of sentences to pupils and parents and head teachers. And in the RE community, we seem to be at sixes and sevens on this issue. It's about inculcating faith. It's about uh, our cultural legacy. It's about personal development. It's about spiritual and moral development. It's about an academic um, area of life. It's, is it really about all of those things? Can we do all of those things in one or two lessons a week? No, of course not. And because we don't know the answer to this question, and we're not clear as a community about this question, we are sending teachers naked into the conference chamber when it comes to defending their subject in schools. 
Julie, uh, Dr. Julie Ipgrave is at the Warwick Religious and Education Research Unit at Warwick University. Debating is not actually a very unusual thing in our society because people are always disagreeing about things and, and a sort of standard bar stool debate or quarrel in the playground or whatever. Um, and I think RE has come to be seen as a bit of a soft subject because it's just a place where people are sharing opinions and discussing, debating, but actually those opinions are not necessarily grounded in deep knowledge and learning. And I think in order to raise the status of RE, we need to have a real improvement in the knowledge and the um, grounding of people's religious literacy, um, the content, if you like, of the subject, so that when they do get together and debate, which is what they love doing, it's actually really well founded in something quite rigorous. Sarah Hall is a lecturer in RE at Birmingham University. Sarah. RE teachers for many years now haven't received funding to train to be teachers. This is changing next year. And I think that says something about the status. So current trainees are funding university themselves, which is the £9,000 fees. Well, uh, people training to do maths or physics or English or humanities are receiving funding. Rachel uh, Jackson Royal is an RE teacher and also, uh, like Daniel, a member of the executive committee of the National Association of Teachers of Religious Education. Rachel. As a teacher and from listening to my pupils, to me what's more fundamentally important is breadth. Well, sorry, depth rather than breadth, get the right way around. Um, I much prefer to study less religions, but make sure I studied those well, that I've done it from a multifaceted approach, so therefore they've realised that there may be some core central concepts that unite people of that particular faith together, but there may be different varieties of that depending on where you've come from. But it comes back to, you have to come back to the reality that you're in. And the reality is we don't have a lot of time. I'd love to have more, the same amount of time as an English teacher has, but I don't. I have two lessons a week, and sometimes I lose those because they're off on a trip on this day. So you have to come back to that, whatever decision it is that you make. Daniel Hugel is a religious education teacher and an executive committee member of the National Association of Teachers of RE. Daniel. If you're a primary school teacher in training in the last five years, about 50% of primary school teachers report that they get three hours of training during their whole training to deal with religious education. So that's three hours to cover all these things, all these grand aims that we would like to be able to do, um, that we would like teen teenagers, well, in primary school, uh, lower age children to discuss, to debate, to talk about. So you've got to cover six major, major world religions, non-religious beliefs in three hours. I think that's absolutely right, and RE does remain the subject that is most likely to be taught by a non-specialist um, in, in secondary school, and that's obviously uh, completely wrong. But I think that really the underlying reason why, for example, teaching of RE is underinvested in is something to do with the status of the subject itself. It is not on the same level as other humanities subjects within the national curriculum in England. And I think that Although the original way of setting up RE syllabuses on the local level, um, you know, 70 years ago, was intended to purchase certain goods, such as local consensus, I think that the time has come now to really think seriously about giving the subject a proper status alongside other humanities subjects on the national curriculum and lifting, I think, that elevation in its status would also have helpful feed-through effects on the, you know, uh, the willingness to invest in teaching as well and not for RE to always be left behind RE or whatever we want to call it in the future, to be left behind when other subjects are receiving you know, promotion and funding and that higher status. Um, it seems to me that the, the question of what RE is for is intimately connected to its status. Uh, and if we can get clarity about what it's for, uh, then uh, its status will Im improve. And I say that for two reasons. One, one is that RE is already, religion is already something it's difficult to talk about in wider society. And the reaction has tended to be to try and rise above the fray. Don't talk about it. It's safer not to, and it will be simpler not to, too. Um, and, and so RE itself gets marginalised. And it then also gets colonised, because we don't, we don't only not know where to put it or how much of it to do. We don't know what to put in it when we try. So it ends up being populated with proxy issues, uh, like cohesion and citizenship, which draw attention to controversies, like what happens under equality law and when bombs go off. And that all paints such a, um, a one-sided and unhelpful picture of religion that it closes the circle of why it's easier and safer not to talk about it. 
But what we really need is Mark's other point about a big debate nationally on what we used to call, what is called the legal settlement of where religious education sits in the curriculum, now complicated by many other laws that weren't actually about religion in education, but which impact upon it. So human rights law, equality law, we need to sit down and look again at the whole situation of law in relation to religion in our schools. And I think that's one of the most urgent tasks we have. And then I think some of the problems and complications that we have will begin to solve themselves. And let's pay attention to what Tim Oates said in the National Curriculum Review um, two years ago, uh, that all subjects uh, need to do fewer things in greater depth. I'm totally with Rachel as a practitioner on this. Uh, depth needs to be prioritised over depth. But how do we do that in RE without sacrificing um, our, our desire to include and represent as many different religions and worldviews as possible? That's a curriculum design issue. Who's good at curriculum design? not faith community representatives, I submit. And this is the connection to the legal mechanisms. At the moment, we have a system whereby we have 150 or slightly more different syllabuses in operation in this country. Why? Uh, I, I have yet to hear a convincing argument for why that is any longer necessary. We want our children growing up as citizens of the UK and citizens of the globe, not citizens of a town or county or metropolitan borough. And we need to devolve this uh, to schools themselves within a frame of reference that is um, uh, given to us nationally. Um, if we were to do that, and it would take a change in the law, uh, if we were to do that, I think we would clarify a lot of the issues about purpose and about content and how to manage uh, the competing uh, desires to be broad and inclusive and also to go for depth. Broad and inclusive sounds really nice, but I just don't think it's possible in the time that we've got. And I think that it's you know, time to have some core um, minimum that all schools across the country will deliver and then maybe leave room for the local to dictate uh, at the school level what they do extra to that. So I think I would be the one that's quite harsh about this and say we need to do a bit less. Well, no, a lot less and stop worrying as, quite as much about leaving people out. Uh, I, my ears fail to hear this word spirituality or spiritual. Um, I, don't, I think that, that's where the, uh, the problem lies. Um, we should be, uh, you know, changing the religious education into spiritual education. I think we'll solve all the problems that I hear on the panel here. The difficulty and short of time, funding, and, you know, all that thing. We should be seeing religion in the context of humanity, not restricting children to seeing humanity through the context of different religions. The case for uh, um, uh, the continuing to be locally agreed syllabuses uh, can't just be dismissed, I don't think, in the kind of terms that uh, my good friend Mark uh, has described it as. There's a, a great deal more value to a locally agreed syllabus than... Uh, uh, than, than uh, was covered in the points that he, um, that he made. Some of the very best work that has been done in religious education has come through agreed syllabus conferences. Hampshire's often quoted as an example of that. And I would be very sorry to lose all of that local ownership and innovation and energy and creativity if we had a national agreed syllabus of some sort. So we need to keep the very best of local determination in a situation that certainly does need to be clarified. I'm a Hindu, and first question that people would like to know is, okay, you're Hindu, but what caste are you? You know, uh, so this caste uh, uh, issue, I thought, I'd left behind you know, in India. And then when we investigated, we found out that the RE uh, uh, subject in education system is promoting casteism within the schools. Um, the representation of uh, your faith in textbooks and in some agreed syllabuses uh, is a, pro a real problem. Um, to, to widen it out uh, uh, beyond your immediate point, I think I would also say that every religion studied 
has its, historically, has its negative as well as its positive facets. Uh, for Hinduism, it is the caste system. Uh, one might say that for Christianity, it is historically fear and hatred of women and narratives of the superiority of European Christianity over other cultures and religions. For me, it's important that young people growing up in this country learn the negative as well as the positive facets. And that is part of the critical apparatus that they need to become literate and to become constructive citizens. Now, in my previous life, I've been an inspector uh, and I am a teacher trainer as well. And I've been into the RE classrooms. And what I often see is what I call candy floss religion being taught. So, for example, uh, if they're doing a Judaism module, which, of course, I would know about, I would say to a child, can you tell me what Shabbat is? And the answer I, I remember having in an offset inspection, oh, that's, that's where you dip an apple in honey, isn't it? Which, of course, is the Jewish New Year. So this is what I mean by candy floss religion. I think there's a lot of candy floss religion, positive uh, all stories have moral worth, no criticism of uh, stories in the Bible which seem un unquestionably bad. Um, and, but we're not going to get there unless we have specialists teaching this. You know, you, if we want people te teaching about the caste system really, really correctly and really academically, we need experts and we need to train them. The, uh, the Carter Review for Initial Teacher Training has got subject knowledge as a priority and for to what extent is the panel encouraged by this? You know, I know myself, my... My degree and my doctorate is in 9th century BCE, Hebrew, Egyptology. I can say I've never used any of my degree in the classroom at all. I've had to teach myself ethics, philosophy, New Testament. Judaism is my area of specialism, but not as a subject. I was doing um, more kind of classical and archaeology. So we've got that kind of issue where RE practitioners might have various degrees. It's the same with history. But because they have a national curriculum, if you've studied... Uh, medieval history and you know that the national curriculum is on modern British history, you learn that. As an RE practitioner, I've worked with two different diocesan syllabuses. I've worked with three different um, locally agreed syllabuses. I've written on two and I'm now in Birmingham with a completely different um, agreed syllabus. And our trainees are, are working in several different um, settings as well and learning all of this. So I think, again, from that perspective, something that was common would help practitioner knowledge. I don't think that any of the purposes that have been laid out for the study of religions and beliefs in our schools today can seriously be met unless non-religious worldviews are studied. I think that it makes a joke of the aspirations of having young people that are engaged with the reality of today's society and have opportunities for personal development if they don't have access to humanist and other non-religious views. I think it's essential. Wouldn't it be lovely if we could have discussions as a national community and all be talking about the same thing rather than having these continual perpetual discussions about what we are and aren't about. As a teacher, I have taught in so many different schools and I have never ever taught the same syllabus in any school that I have taught in. That includes A-level and GCSE as well as Key Stage 3. Um, much of my first degree has very little, although it was in religious studies, some of it I've managed to draw on for what I do, some of it I don't. My master's, I couldn't believe when I came away from my master's how much the textbooks in schools had nothing to do with what I had been studying firsthand for my master's. Um, in my doctorate, which was more about pedagogy, now when I look at teaching resources, I see the absence of pedagogical approaches. It's just information and not how you can translate that, translate that best towards the pupils in the classroom. So to me, it's not just subject specialism, but it's also the dearth of resources. The dearth of resources, I think, that aren't in detail enough that sometimes aren't accurate. Sometimes you get the same information written by a different author that's still inaccurate, that's not up to date with the research that's taking place currently, both in the UK and elsewhere. Um, as a teacher, you're really struggling to get access to that. You're trying to find the best resources that are out there, but you can't get hold of them all. It seems to be the same old, same old that's there that you don't want to use anymore. And not only that, it needs to be written in such a way that it is taking on board how pupils learn. And some of it doesn't do this. Some of it is too dry, it's boring, and you end up looking at the textbook, sticking it in a cupboard, creating something of your own. And I think most teachers that I engage with, that's what we do. We look at it as a basis, we create something of our own that actually works in a classroom setting. Because at the end of the day, we are dealing with pupils, and we're looking at the pedagogical development of those pupils. And a lot of the resources there don't work with that. So to me, it's twofold. 
Um, my concern is actually about the way um, debates work and how this can sometimes occlude the purpose um, of what's going on in a classroom. So I come from a background of philosophy and sometimes the problem with debates, and I think there are some people on the panel who participate in things like the big questions, and what we find in those sorts of debates is that we lose nuance and it just becomes about point scoring and winning. When the funding gets changed, and there is now funding for the RE teachers, will the teachers who've been trained before be able to access any of that funding so that we'll redress the imbalance? I think the importance of universities in initial teacher training is, well, it can't be overstated. When I taught on a PGCE course, I really thought one year just is not enough to train anybody to be a teacher. It should be two years, and there should be a continuing program beyond that. And until we professionalise teacher training, we're not going to get anywhere with any of these arguments, really. I'm interested in um, getting a view on what various members of the panel feel about the increase in faith schools with regard to this, because clearly there are um, more and more faith schools who um, presumably would um, uh, promote a, a specific faith over general um, religious discussion. And indeed, there may well be some schools that would actually deny basic um, scientific principles as described by both Darwin and Wallace 150 years ago. No one in this panel said that religious education is about raising a child in a particular faith or in a particular religion or in nurturing them into a particular tradition. And I think that if we really take that seriously, there's serious questions um, for a lot of state-funded religious schools um, in terms of whether or not what they term RE and are delivering in their schools, many of us will have seen both good and bad practice in this respect in, in so-called faith schools, but I think there's a serious question for them as to whether or not if they're going to carry on doing confessional instruction in their schools, if they must, whether or not they might also be obliged to do the sort of open RE that all of us are talking about. So that's a point about that. That RE is not the make your mind up time about religion and that's something that happens outside school. And I think when we're talking about what RE isn't, I think the idea of being a place where young people can decide their beliefs and their faith is not what RE should be in mainstream schools, however much okay. flexibility they're given to do that. We, we've heard a number of uh, solutions to what should populate the RE space this afternoon. Um, spirituality, humanity, being good, getting on. Those are all laudable. They might occupy that space. But I want an RE space that equips young people to engage well with any religion, belief or none, uh, not to teach anyone how to be any of them. Um, I can say on behalf of Linda and myself that we are determined to take this discussion further forward uh, because I do think the 1944 settlement and which created the legal framework which you for example are referring to uh, was a, a very profound and important development for 1944 but 2014 2015 is different now the question is how it's different how religion has changed how schools have changed how do we deal with that but I think promoting a discussion about how we get to a change in that area does seem, I think, Linda, to both of us, a very important thing for us to do. And finally, thank you uh, for coming today and making what I think has been a very good session. Thank you very much. Thank you.